so I'm going to talk today about a communication problem uh, in which I'm going to use this strange theory called majorization theory. Do you have a pointer, by the way? If not, it's okay. I mean, it's. It's okay. I can use. My. So I'm going to use. I'm going to use this theory um, to solve a problem that otherwise couldn't be solved, as you will see. As far as I know, maybe somebody can come up with another way to solve the problem. Um, okay, I'm going to talk in particular about linear MIMO transceivers and decision feedback MIMO transceivers. Okay? The linear stuff is old stuff, I would say, a few years old. The decision feedback is, is new. So. I'm going to go straight to the point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce the signal model quickly, because th this is actually a long talk. Uh, and then I'm going to start with the problem formulation. By the way, formulating the problem is going to take me a long time, because I will, I will have to simplify uh, many times the problem. Okay? And at the end, I will be able actually to deal with the linear case using major decision theory, and then the decision feedback case. Okay? Probably I will not have time to go into, into this bullet here. Uh, in which, well, if I have time, I would talk about sure convex and sure concave functions. But if not, that's okay. Okay, so let me start with the signal model. It's a signal model that we all know. This is a MIMO channel. We know that MIMO channels arise in many different uh, physical scenarios, right? Wireless multi antenna, DSL, CDMA systems. And we can always write the, the system model like this H is the channel, it's a, it's a matrix. S is the vector that we transmit, Y is the signal that we received, and then the noise. Right? A very simple signal model. Now, uh, what is a linear transceiver? A linear transceiver is some linear processing that, I, that I'm going to do at the transmitter, and some linear processing that I'm going to do at the receiver. Uh, so that's, what, that's why I call this linear MIMO transceiver. And the signal model is very easy, again. Essentially, we are going to include a matrix at the transmitter, which is like a precoder, linear precoder. That's why I call it P as in precoder, and then another matrix at the receiver, it's like an equalizer. I call it W, you will see why later. Okay, so that's it, it's a very simple signal model. So X is gonna be a vector with symbols, symbols from some constellation, whatever, QAM, QPSK, whatever. Okay? So I'm gonna transmit, say, L symbols through this channel. Okay? So I will precode this, this vector of symbols, and I will get S, then I will transmit that, and then on the receiver I will, I will process Y with the equalizer to get X, X hat. That's going to be an estimation of the transmitted vector, okay? So the goal here is going to be to design somehow P and W, the, the transmitter and the receiver, to make the estimation as close as possible to the, to the transmitted vector. However, it's not clear what I mean with that. As close as possible is not clear. <coughs> I have to define that properly later. Um, something important here is the power used at the transmitter is given by this. It's given by the trace of P times P Hermitian. Excuse me. Yeah. So you're implying that uh, trace of X, X Hermitian is in one. Yes, yes. So here. is normalized to one. And exactly, uh, uh, exactly. P takes all the power. Exactly. So X, uh, the symbols are normalized to one and they're uncorrelated. So that I, I have this, this here. So that's it. Essentially, this is a signal model, very simple. Right? Now, for the decision feedback case, it's going to be the same thing, but I'm going to have here some decision feedback part, you know, as we all know. But apart from that, it's going to be the same thing. So you see, the only difference is this. this so there is a third matrix here that I will have to design, B. B uh, as in backward. It's a backward matrix, so that's why I call it B. Right? So the idea here is that from this x hat, what I'm going to do is, it, this is a classical decision feedback uh, in the space dimension, right? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to make a decision, say, on the last symbol of the vector. Once I make the decision, I will cancel all the effect of that symbol from the received signal. Okay? And then I, I can make a decision on the second symbol. And, you know, decision feedback scheme. What that implies is that th this matrix has to be triangular. In particular, uh, strictly triangular. I'm going to take it upper triangular, for example. Okay, so this B has to be strictly upper triangular to preserve causality and, and the fact that I don't know the symbol that I that I ha still have to detect. Okay, that, that's that's what it what it means. Okay, and again, as before, the power that, that I use at the transmitter is the trace of P times P Hermitian. 
everything is the same. The estimated signal before was given only by this term. Now I have this additional term. I'm going to assume perfect decisions in, in, this, in this loop, okay, as is commonly done. Okay. This is, okay. yeah. I'm sorry. B should be multiplied by x hat, not by x. Exactly, exactly. You don't yeah, but I'm, I'm going to assume perfect decisions so that I can use x instead. Okay. This is justified uh, if you use some code. So if you use some code on top of each substream, you can first decode. Okay, thank you. You can first decode one substream. You can use the decoding. You can you can use the. Do you consider the time sequences or strictly these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so. This is just one transmission. You will have many transmissions in time. So the idea, if you don't, if you want to have no errors, what you have to do is you have to transmit many, many symbols. You use some co powerful code, and then you can first de decode only the first the one of the symbols, right? For example, the, the last symbol in the vector in time. You decode that using the code. You make sure there are no errors, and then you can go to the next layer. Mm, so, pro probably let's take it offline, but. My problem is this, that if you're using powerful code, you know, you cannot decode just single symbol. You will probably decode the whole block. So you, you really uh, buffer. You yeah, 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 yeah. You need to buffer, yeah, yeah. Then you decode one of the streams, and then you use it now. But if for some reason you cannot decode, either you're pushing the errors, or you just cannot, if you have like CRC protection or some kind of error detection, on the code, so if you fail to decode and you understand, then you probably can just not do. You know. Yeah, yeah, this is correct. So you're right. So here I'm going to assume that you use a code and you can decode well, perfectly. Of course, if there is an error, it's going to propagate. Okay. The analysis of that is a whole issue by itself. Mm -hmm. There are there are several papers that deal with that in the past, and uh, it's a very hard topic to deal with errors in the feedback process. So here we are going to assume perfect decision. Yeah. yeah. But later in the simulations, you can use non-perfect decisions. You can use the, the, the actual decisions. And the performance is, is very close to this ideal situation. Okay? And it's even better if you assume a, a powerful goal. So anyway, this is what we are going to assume. Otherwise, the, the, the analysis is extremely difficult. So this is the signal model. Any more questions about the? Just one yep. last question, and they will probably shut up. Uh, so how, how is it any different from BLAST? In BLAST, they also do very similar things. So they uh, use yeah, yeah. metrics. They the try to get one yeah, and yeah, yeah. subtract from the next layer. And so the decision feedback idea scheme, this is well known from, like, from the 60s, as I will overview now in the, in the literature overview. That comes from the 60s. Uh, so there is nothing new in this decision feedback scheme. Okay, uh, what is going to be new is on how I design P, W, and B. That's going to be. And in BLAST, typically you don't know the channel at the transmitter, so the precoder. Typically, there is no precoder. But I didn't mention that here. But I'm going to assume that the channel is known at both sides. Okay, so for me the channel is going to be fixed. So this only applies to situations where you can estimate the channel. It's slowly varying channel, and, and that's it. Okay. So if you don't know the channel of the transmitter, then you need to use some space-time coding or blast or whatever. It's a different, different approach. OK. So and, and don't shut up, please. I mean, I ask I'm, as many questions as you want. This is what you were asking, actually. It's a, the history, OK? So the, the linear case, the history goes back to the, to the 70s even for MIME, OK? So let me go back and let me emphasize. I was saying before that I want to make this estimation as close as possible to the transmitted vector, right? What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at, this is a vector with many symbols. If you look at one symbol, you can easily define the mean square error in the estimation of that symbol. But you, we have L symbols. So we have L mean square errors. What does it mean when I say, that I want to make these as close as possible to this one. What does it mean? What do I do with these mean square errors? Well, if you go to the history, what people were doing in the past, in the 70s, is they were minimizing the sum of the mean square errors. 
They were doing that because this is a very nice cost function. It's very nice to manipulate the function. But, well, you can, you, you can see that minimizing the sum of the mean square errors may, may not be the best thing to do, and if, in practice it, it is not, okay? So, but that's what people were doing, you know, for, for many years. Uh, and then, r more recently, some people started considering other criteria. Not many, actually. Some people consider, like, maximizing some kind of SNR, some others minimizing the video rate. And then, later, there was, in 2003, there was this uh, unified framework based on major decision theory, by which you could design all these uh, transceiver and receivers uh, for most cost functions you can think of. And in fact, I came here two years ago and I talked about that, that particular paper. I don't know if, if, if you may remember, but I talked about that topic. How to design this transceiver for the linear case only for a family of functions, sure convex and sure concave. But today I'm not going to talk about that. It's going to be more general and for the decision feedback. Anyway, and then over the following years, that framework was developed. So at the end, we can deal not just with sure concave and sure convex functions, but for any function. And more interestingly, for the decision feedback case. So the history for the decision feedback case also goes back to the 60s, 70s for SISO and then for MIMO. Um, then very recently, some people started to consider other criteria. Oh, by the way, in, in this case, with decision feedback, the, the most common uh, criteria Criterion is the minimization of the determinant of the mean square root matrix. Mm -hmm. Again, because the determinant is still is, is still a very nice function. It has the circularity property. You can manipulate that easily. But recently, some people have considered other criteria. In particular, two groups of people. In one group in, in McMaster University and the other one in University of Florida. So, and then more recently, a unified framework, also based on major decision theory, was developed for the decision feedback case. So we are going to see today these two frameworks for the linear case and the decision feedback case. We are going to see that at the same time. And you will see that they are very parallel, okay? Although very different also, okay? This is very recent. This is in you know, last year for the decision feedback case, okay? Any question? About okay, so let me start. I'm going to start by defining this mean square error matrix because it's very convenient. Uh, so X here is the, the transmitted symbols. X hat the estimation. So the difference is the error. It's a vector, the error vector, right? So this is nothing else but the covariance matrix of the error. And this is what I call the mean square error matrix. And for the linear case, it's very easy to see that this can be written like this. Okay? It's a, it's a function. It, this is a matrix, so it's a function of P, the precoder, of course, and W, the receiver, okay? It's very important to notice here that the mean square error of the substreams of the different symbols that I transmit is contained in the diagonal elements of this matrix. Okay? That's why this matrix is very convenient, because in the diagonal elements, I have the mean square error of the substreams. So from now on, I'm going to be playing with this matrix. In the linear case. In the, linear, in the previous case, I, I thought trace should be a, a, an obvious, minimizing the trace of the mean square matrix should be an obvious choice. Why did they use I mean, the determinant? Determin oh, because in the decision feedback case, using the techniques that they use, at the end you get a determinant. So it, it makes sense to minimize the determinant, especially if in the SISO case, in the SISO case, Minimizing the mean square error of one symbol at any given time at the end results in a determinant of a big matrix. So it, in the SISO case, minimizing the determinant, it makes sense. In the MIMO, well, uh, not really. But the thing is that both functions, the trace and the determinant, are very nice. Both have this circularity property. And you, they use that a lot. So you have the trace of identity plus A times B. You, it's equal to the trace of identity B times A, right? You can change the order. The same for the determinant. But for any, for any other function, you don't have that. And that's why we need um, major recession theory. So OK, this is, the, this is for the linear case. Now, 
I'm going to formulate the problem for the linear case. Okay? Instead of minimizing, say, the sum of the mean square rows, here I'm going to be as general as I can, and I'm say I'm going to minimize any function of the mean square rows of the different substreams. Okay? Any function. Uh, and I'm going to minimize this with respect to P and W, the transmitter and the receiver, subject to the power constraint. It's a very simple problem formulation, right? I want to emphasize that this function is any function you want. Uh, the only thing I want to ask to this function, uh, we, and this is obvious, is that it has to be non-decreasing. Non-decreasing means that if I fix all the mean square errors and I, and I decrease one of them, of course that's going to be better, right? So in that case, I don't want this function to increase, of course. So that's what I, that's what I mean by non-decreasing. But it, it wouldn't make any sense to choose a function which doesn't satisfy this, right? So that's it. So this is my problem formulation, and remember that these mean squares are given by this. Um, it's a simple problem formulation, but you can see easily that it's non-convex in the variables p and w. Why? You can easily see that, for example, here, this is quadratic. It's w times p, so this is quadratic. But then this is multiplied by, again, another term, which is quadratic, so it's to the power of 4. So it's clearly non-convex, and these are matrices, so it's even worse. So this is really highly non-convex. And that's only looking at the mean square error. I, I didn't even think of the, of the function. So this is hard to solve. However, if we fix P, if we fix the transmitter, optimizing only with respect to the receiver, that's really easy. That's well known, really easy. Why? Because if you fix P, then this term here becomes quadratic in W, quadratic and convex. And W is not constrained in the problem, so you can easily optimize with respect to W. You can, for example, take the, the derivative with respect to W, set that equal to zero, and you find the optimal W. I'm going to give you, in the next slide, the, the optimal solution, which is well known, okay? So there's nothing new. So we can do that, and we are going to do that. We fix P, and we find the optimal W. What do you think you're going to get if you do that? Well, you get the Wiener filter. So the Wiener filter minimizes simultaneously all the mean square errors. There is no trade-off, actually. So it minimizes all of them. So actually, this is the optimum receiver, uh, regardless of the function that we choose, because that receiver minimizes all the mean square errors anyway. So anyway, so there is nothing new here, OK? This is the Wiener filter. And now, if we plug this expression into the previous expression for the mean square error, okay, then we get this concentrated mean square error matrix here, which looks simpler right now, right? But it's not really simpler, because we have the inverse, and this is very nasty. So we have a quadratic matrix, and then the inverse, that's really nasty. So it's, that's the difficulty of this problem. Okay? By the way, the R, the matrix R, is just a fixed matrix. It's the channel. It's the channel squared. It's a fixed matrix, OK? So the, the variable here is P. Okay? So now we are going to deal with this guy. As you will see, we will need to use major recession theory to deal with this guy. Any questions at this point? Yep. Are you first fixing P and optimizing with respect to W and then optimizing with respect to P in this new expression? Yes, but it's, it's not that I optimize with respect to the W, then I fix W, and then I optimize with respect to P. That, that wouldn't be optimal. What I do is I optimize with respect to W. Yeah, for a fixed uh, and this is a function of p. Yeah, and then, optimize yeah, and then I will optimize with respect to p. So in, in no, 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 you don't lose anything because implicitly, this is already the optimum as a function of p, and you are including that here already. So implicitly, every time you change here p, you are implicitly changing the optimum w for that for the new p. So you you, you don't lose anything. You can always see that it's a nested. Uh, that's true for any non-convex problem? Yeah, yeah, for any non-convex. Yeah, you don't even need if convex. Is it possible that it's convex in one variable with the other aspects you could apply the same technique? So what I'm saying, this nested thing is true regardless of the function. So you don't need convexity or anything. It's because implicitly, every time you change P, you're going to be changing W already. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm answering the question. Yeah, it's a very powerful tool because the original problem was non-convex. Yeah, yeah, no, but, yeah, but is this is still non-convex, so it's, it's not that you... Uh, yeah, yeah, this is still non-convex in P, so... But it's a very powerful tool because the original problem was non-convex, but it's a very powerful tool because the original problem was non-convex. 
will use the Yeah, I will use. Yeah. yeah. It's a simplification that may lead to something easier or not. So at this point, it's not clear. Actually, the, the original papers dealing with, with, with linear transceivers, they were not doing that, actually. They were, they were fixing the receiver, finding the KKT condition for the transmitter, then they were fixing the transmitter, finding the KKT condition for the receiver, and they were solving, solving jointly those couple cons uh, conditions. That was the original approach. So this is different, so, yeah. Yep. Would you please uh, remind what is uh, R sub n? Uh, ah, it's the, it's the covariance uh, matrix of the noise. Of the noise. Yeah, I didn't say that, actually. Yeah. So if noise is white, then just... That would be identity, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now that I have the optimal receiver, I can rewrite my original problem like this. Okay? And it doesn't really look simpler. Uh, well, I, I don't know. Look, here I'm minimizing an arbitrary function of the mean square error. Now I, I, I know that the mean square errors are equal to the diagonal, this means diagonal elements of the matrix inside. Okay? Uh, why? Well, because, you know, I know that the mean square errors are, are contained in the diagonal elements of this matrix, right? So that, that's what I'm writing here. So mean square errors are equal to the diagonal elements of this inverse. And then I have the power constraint. So this is my problem now. Now I have to optimize only with respect to P. Yep. Sorry, this may be a stupid question, but when you found W as the optimum, I thought the function F not, F not was not included. Yep. Yep. Because uh, with the Vino filter, what happens is that all the mean square errors are minimized at the same time. There is no trade-off. So regardless of the function, because the function was not decreasing, minimizing all the mean square errors to the maximum is the best thing you can do independently of the function. Right? So that's why I didn't need to use the function to derive the optimal receiver. Now it's different. Now to optimize the transmitter, the mean square errors are actually coupled. You can see that because, for example, you can decide to put more power in one substream to make it better. But if you do that, you will have to use less power in the other ones. So you can see that from the point of view of the transmitter, improving, decreasing one mean square error, it's, it's going to imply that the other ones are going to increase. So there is a trade-off. It's not clear. And the trade-off comes from the function, right? But from the point of view of the receiver, there is no trade-off. The Wiener filter minimizes simultaneously all the mean square errors. So that, that's why. Maybe I'm missing something. So. Is that function uh, a one-valued function of one variable or multi-dimensional? Okay, so the argument is a vector. It contains the mean square errors. And the output is a scalar. So we are measuring the, the performance of the system with one number. Yeah. Like, for example, the, the, the sum of the mean square errors. That's one example. You take several mean square errors, and the output is the sum. He imposed some very peculiar peculiar property of this f function. If it's a, f it's a uh, the argument is a vector, so it's multiple uh, arguments in fact. If one reduces one of the values of the errors, then the uh, function should only go down. It can never go up. Regardless of what happens to the others. No, no fix the others fixing the others. If the others fixing fixed, and one goes down, it only makes things better. That's actually the reason why he's claiming that if uh, p is fixed, uh, for under this constraint, any function will be minimized by the Wiener filter because mm -hmm. the Wiener filter makes all the errors at their minimum. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but I have to say that I don't see that as a constraint that I'm adding. I well, from obviously there are some uh, functions which just do not satisfy that property. Okay, but then I could improve that function, right? If you give me a function that decreasing one mean square error. It, it increases. I can redefine a new oh, function well, fixing that. I think you're saying those functions are practical. Practically, you would consider functions which, like if you have mean square from many sources and some of mean square product from mean square, those are the functions of interest practically. And you won't consider a system where mean square decreases in one. Because if mean square increases in one variable, but the cost comes instead. No, but I think your results are applicable even when if, if you take away f not also, right? Yeah. Yeah, but you like, if you choose a function like that, it will, the function will be lying to you, right? It means that you have chosen a function, a function that if you decrease one minus per error in one particular point, it increases. So it's like lying to you because that function will be telling you that 
it's better to have the system with a higher mean square error than with uh, with okay, I think we probably move on, but just one remark that uh, sometimes, the, like if you do, for example, the decoding, just mean square error in general is just a wrong metric. Okay, that's an so Yeah, that's a different issue. Yeah. You, you can actually sometimes you have a uh, code and you have a stream, and if it's not strictly a WGN, what could happen that you can have a smaller let's say frame error rate or block error rate even if your mean square error is higher so it just all depends how you call this done and mm -hmm. what the statistics of the noise mm -hmm. yeah well i would like to see a function like that Even if you, well, anyway, we can continue on later. Okay, so this is the problem formula, the simplified problem formulation for the linear case once I have optimized the receiver, right? <coughs> that was the easy part. Now it's the difficult part, okay? Now let me go to the decision feedback case. I want to do both in parallel, okay? So I'm going to do the same steps, exactly the same steps, okay? First step is to define the mean square error matrix in the same way, is it the same definition? But for the signal model in the decision feedback case, the only difference is that there is a B. There is the additional B, right? That's the only difference. If I make B zero, then I get exactly the same as in the linear case, right? And well, the same thing applies here, right? The mean square of the substreams is contained in the diagonal elements of E of the matrix, okay? Same thing, right? Now, I can formulate the problem. It's the same formulation as before, but now I need to minimize also with respect to B. Okay, now it's more difficult. I have to minimize with respect to P, W, B. What, what am I going to minimize? An arbitrary function of the mean square errors. Arbitrary, I'm gonna assume that it's a non-decreasing function like before, okay? So that's it. Same thing as before. It's more complicated because now I have three optimization variables. Like before, the problem is non-convex in P, W, and B, okay? It's non-convex. But I can use similar ideas. Um, you can easily see that, for example, if I fix P and B, it's like before. I can optimize with respect to W because it's quadratic and convex. I can do the same thing. Take the derivative, set that equal to zero, and I obtain the optimal W. Okay? Fixing P and B. Now, also, if I, do, if I do a different thing, if I fix W and P, I can easily see what is the optimal B, right? And now, now I am mixing things, actually. Now it looks like I am coupling things, so we have to be careful, okay? So I said that if we fix P and B, I can find easily the optimal W. And on the other hand, if I fix W and P, I can find easily B. And this is, again, not new, okay? So this is nothing new. What is the optimal B, given that this guy is fixed? This would be like the effective channel after the precoder and the equalizer, effective channel. Well, the best thing we can do with B is to let B subtract all the interference from the previously detected symbol, right? With the constraint, of course, that B is upper triangular, okay? Remember? Yeah. But should it be, so just the way how it looks here means that because I plus B, so it actually suggests that you, when you did, when you were doing your decoding, B was multiplied by the actual X, yeah. not the Big, X. Yeah. So Big. we are back to that thing that you are kind of using the information you do not have. Perfect decisions, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming perfect so decisions. why not just might be the way of suggestion for the future work? If you would write B times X hat, and then you can move this term to the left together with X hat, so you will just have, you, you can still proceed with exactly the way you do. Just your expressions become a little bit more involved. This might be more inverse matrices, but it's still doable. Just replace x in your feedback loop with x hat. Then you move all x hats to the left side. Group whatever terms. Call it a new matrix. Whatever b prime. You can, mm, yeah, but you cannot you cannot do exactly the same things that I'm gonna do now. But, yeah, certainly we should take a closer look. But you cannot really do the things we are going to do. It becomes more complicated, but, yeah. X is obtained after quantization. Yeah, yeah, it's after quantization, after the decision. 
Sorry? How would he model quantization? How would you model quantization if you do it? He, yeah, I'm assuming linear case. perfect decision. No, no, I know what you're doing, but what I'm saying is whatever he proposes. Uh -huh. How would you model quantization? But red rock. How he will particular? How he will build this uh, practical? That, that's receiver. another issue. He's just modeling if, his. You his know, if he doesn't know X at all. Uh, no, no, it, this is a standard assumption. But yeah, it's an assumption. Assuming that you. Decision feedback uh, equalization, uh, any kind of. Oh, but then he has at least feedback. to add the term. So typically, what people do is they say, okay, suppose you are in a regime where you have perfect decisions, then you sort of try to come up with some kind of an optimal design, and then you sort of exercise that when you don't have it and see how, how well it does. Yeah, but then the error right. will be underestimated. Because right. so what, 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 people, what I saw in the papers, what they do, yeah. they actually, since they don't know exactly what it is, they actually write the plus the term B times delta X, where delta X, that's a known error term, which you can actually put some statistics on top of it. So then when you estimate, you actually use a covariance matrix for that, right. for but error think, statistics. But I think for the majorization you're going to do, right, he really needs the, the X. Otherwise, he probably can't. No, it, it's a good idea to try to model statistically that error and yeah. see if, if, if uh, uh, it's, no, yeah. This is actually not so non-standard. This kind of an approach to sort of doing decision feedback well, design. It's not a question of the standard or not, because it's accurate or not. Well, it, look, DFE designs have been around for a long time, so they work as well as they work. Oh, in my mind, they actually uh, there is so, so quite I very think, serious problems. I think the real test is, the you know, if you the exercise sort of his model, in the case where he does not know it, and let's see how it works. Yeah, we did that, and it worked right. well. But no, it's, yeah, it's true that we could try to model statistically the noise, and that would be a more accurate mm -hmm. uh, modeling. The error. Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, the error. Yeah, that would be more accurate than, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so I was saying, so assuming perfect decisions, what is the optimal B? Assuming uh, WMP fixed. That's easy. I mean, we, it's well known. You want to cancel as much as possible with the constraint that B has to be strictly upper triangular. So what you do is you make the upper triangular part of B equal to the effective channel. Okay. So this is the same as saying that you you subtract all the effect of the of the decided symbols. Okay. So this is what I what I'm saying. Okay. So but this argument um, is a bit fishy because it's coupled together. So if I fix P and B. I can find the optimal W. And then if I fix W and P, I can find the optimal B. But they are coupled together, right? So, yeah. but not really, not really, okay? It's, it looks coupled, but not. It's like an optical illusion. It's not because of the following reason. Look at, look at this. B is up strictly upper triangular. That means that the first column of B is zero. I know that already. So I can compute the first column of W right away. Now, having the first column of W, I have the first row here, so I can compute the first row of B, right? Now, if, I ha if B is strictly upper triangular and I have the first row, I also have the second column, right? So the now I can go back here and I have the second column of B, I can compute the second column of W, and I can go on. So they look coupled together, but they are not. I can go column by column. They are not coupled together, OK? So why is the first column of B0? And it's because it's strictly upper triangular. So if I, can I, can I draw something in the, is there a, so upper triangular means that the, the diagonal is 0. Oh, okay, okay. So you know, right? it means that these elements are whatever. But these are zero. That, that, that is upper triangular. Is the but also zero? Is yeah, because I said strictly upper triangular. Strictly upper triangular, it means that also the diagonals are zero. So then that's why the first column, you see, it's completely zero. Yeah, so that, that's why. OK, so this is fine. Then we can, we can find the optimal B and uh, W and B. Uh, there is another way to write, but this is not new. Huh? Okay. There is another way to write this optimal receiver. It's, it's as follows. You take the effective channel. I, I'm not going to go into detail here, but you take the effective channel and you extend that with the identity matrix, and, and you find the QR decomposition. Okay, this is what people have done in the past, and then you can actually write the optimal W and B from the from Q and R as functions of Q and R. You can do that. Okay, but you know, I didn't put it here. 
the interesting thing here is that if you use the optimal receiver, it turns out that the mean square error matrix becomes diagonal, and it can be written as a function of the diagonal elements of R of this QR decomposition. Okay? This is well known also. So you take the QR decomposition, you take the diagonal elements of R, and then you form this matrix dr. dr is diagonal containing the diagonal elements of r. And then you take the power to the minus 2. Okay. So that's it. If you use the optimal receiver, you get this, which follows from the qr. So it's a bit messy altogether, but let me write it down altogether. I know it's messy, but that's it. That's what we have so far. So we have, we want to minimize a function of the mean square errors. Now, we know that the mean square errors are given from here by the diagonal elements of r to the power of minus 2, right? So I have that they are given by the diagonal elements of r to the power of minus 2, and r comes from the QR decomposition of this guy here, and then the power constraint. Okay? And then I have many optimization variables here, the mean square errors, p, q, r. Okay, so it looks crazy, I know. Uh, but, well, we will have to use majorization theory to deal with this. Okay? so. Finally, I have been able to formulate the problem. Okay, so this is just the problem formulation. Okay, linear case and decision feedback case. Okay, the difficulty here is this inverse of a matrix, which is very nasty. And the difficulty here, well, it's the QR decomposition inside of the of the problem. Okay, any questions at this point? Now I'm gonna deal with these two mathematical problems. Okay, so first step is one simplification that I'm going to make here. It's, it's not difficult. Let me first write the eigenvalue of RH, okay? Of the channel, square channel, okay? It's given by this, okay? This is the channel. And let me write the singular value decomposition of the precoder, yeah? because it's more convenient. So now, instead of optimizing P, I'm going to optimize U, sigma, and omega. U and omega are unitary matrices, and sigma is a diagonal matrix that contains like the power equation. So now it looks like it's even more complicated but now because now I have to optimize u, sigma, and omega. But let's see what I can do. The first thing that can be shown here uh, based on some matrix algebra, it's not, not that difficult, is that the optimal u is equal to the eigenvectors of the channel. It makes sense. Intuitively, it makes sense. So that this is saying that the optimal transmit directions have to be equal to the directions of the channel. So essentially, you diagonalize the channel. That's it. That's the first result. Okay, You can do it using some matrix algebra. And now, once I do that, let me take this nasty expression that we had, right? the mean square error matrix, and let me put inside all these things. Let me put inside the eigenvalue decomposition, the SVD. And just because u is equal to VH, so this u is equal to VH. When I multiply these two guys, they are going to cancel out, right? Because they are unitary matrices. So things simplify a little bit. So this is what I get then. Yeah? This is just straightforward substitution. I get this. Okay? Still, it's, not, it's nasty because this is the eigenvalues of the channel. Sigma is the singular values of the precoder. It's a power equation. And then omega is like a, some unitary matrix. Okay? So uh, let me move omega outside of the inverse. Okay, you can always do that with unitary matrices. Okay, so this is the first step. Just some makeup, some manipulation. It's not just makeup. Actually, this is not that obvious. Uh, okay, at this point, my problem is like this. Still nasty, okay? So I want to minimize a function of the mean square errors, where the mean square errors are equal to the diagonal elements of this thing here. The problem is this omega, because omega has to be a unitary matrix. So the set of unitary matrices is not even convex. So this is a very nasty problem. Now is when we need majorization theory. OK? Any questions before I jump into majorization theory? OK, so let's see. So majorization theory makes precise the idea that you take two vectors and you want to compare how the elements of the vector are distributed. So it makes precise the idea that the elements of one vector are more uniform than the elements of another vector. It makes precise that idea. It, it allows you to compare two vectors in that sense. So it, it allows you to say, this 
vector is more uniform than this other one. That's what it. And we denote it by this. So here we say that y majorizes x. That means that the elements of x are more uniform than the elements of y. That's what it means. Okay? One, one detail is that the sum of the elements have to, has to be equal for this comparison to make sense. Okay? This is, a, this is the definition of majorization. And this is the exact definition. You see, as I said, the sum of the elements has to be equal. And then there are some partial sums that are there. Okay? Excuse me, if I rotate my coordinate system in this vector space, like change the signal space base vectors, so will this, with whatever majorization property, change, be invalidated? If you is it is it true for one uh, frame, like uh, coordinate coordinate representation, and it's not true for another? Well, uh, I would say that, that no, it's not true. Okay. Is it the invariant property? No, we we'll, we'll actually play with that right now. We will play with rotations of, of these vectors. Okay. Um, you can permute the elements. That's OK. Yeah, permutation I yeah, can, but if I just rotate, like if I have two dimensional vector and just rotate it, so one suddenly becomes 0, 1. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. No, definitely. No, 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 no. You can easily find a counterexample. Yeah. No. I can give you later a very simple counterexample. It's, it's, it's not true. Um, so it's not invariant over rotations, but it is over permutations. Okay, anyway, I don't want you to get lost in this definition because it's difficult to digest. The idea is what I said. These elements are more uniform than the other ones. Uh, that's the idea, okay? I'm sorry, <coughs> what's the significance of the bracket? Yeah, this means that I, I'm taking the elements in decreasing order. <coughs> so the first thing that I do is I order the elements in decreasing order, and then I use these order elements in these partial sums. But yeah, it takes a while to get the intuition from from that. Anyway, I, I don't want to spend time in this detailed definition. I, I'm sorry, are yeah. the elements of these vectors forced to be positive here, or can they be positive and negative? Uh, typically, they are, they are non-negative, but this, this holds also for non-negative. Uh, sorry, for arbitrary elements, yeah. You can actually, yeah, if you can always... Um, yeah, if you take two elements where one element is negative, you can always shift, if you, if you want to think intuitively, you can shift all the elements until all of them are non-negative, if you want, and then it's, it's the same thing. It gives you the same thing. So actually, it's invariant with respect to a shift in all the elements, for example. OK. Um, OK, let's see what majorization theory has to say about matrices, OK? In particular, uh, from this, I am interested in the diagonal elements of some matrix. So let's see, this is a well-known result of Mayer's that talks about diagonal elements of a matrix, okay? So this is the, the basic reference. If you look at uh, that reference, you can find all these results, okay? But I'm, I'm putting together many small results in this, in this equation. Here, there are many results put together. It's, I think it's a very nice uh, equation. And it's well known. It says the following. It says that if I take a matrix M, M is a fixed matrix, a positive semi-definite matrix, okay? Fixed. It says that if I multiply this matrix by a rotation on the right and on the left, if I change the rotation, what happens with the diagonal elements of that matrix? Well, it gives you the answer. What happens is that, first thing, this is telling you that no matter what rotation you use, these diagonal elements are always going to be in between these two extremes. This is the first thing that this is telling you, right? Which is interesting in its own, I think. Okay? So in one extreme, you have the eigenvalues of the matrix. So this is the well-known result that many people know, is that the eigenvalues of a matrix majorize the diagonal elements of the matrix. <coughs> so this is a makeup of that uh, result. Okay? And this one is obvious. Here, this is a vector with equal elements, and the elements are equal to the arithmetic mean of the eigenvalues. Why arithmetic mean? Remember that when we use majorization relationship, we need the sum of the elements to be equal. So if you take the arithmetic mean, it means that when you sum them, it's going to be equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. And by the way, 
of course, the sum of the diagonal elements is always going to be equal to the sum of the eigenvalues, right? This is always true. So everything holds here, right? So omega is a matrix diagonal elements? No, any rotation, any unitary matrix, any. For any unitary matrix, this is true. The diagonal elements are going to be in between. So this is like a this is a necessary condition, right? It holds for any omega. But now, even even more interesting, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. It's like a converse achievability, and that's actually what we are going to use. The opposite says the following: It says, if you give me a vector that is in between these two extremes, I can always find an omega such that the diagonal elements of this is equal to the vector that you gave me. Okay, so it's achievability. So I can actually achieve any vector in between these two extremes. Okay, that's that's what I'm going to use in the next slide. Okay, any question? So look at what I'm going to do now. I'm going to apply it directly. This is the constraint that I have in, in my problem, right? The nasty one. It's nasty because I have this this unitary matrix. So now, instead of writing this in my problem, I'm going to write this one. Look, I'm just going to impose that the mean square error, ve the vector with the mean square error, has to be minorized by the eigenvalues of this. This is exactly what I did before. Why is that? Well, because I know that any vector of mean square errors that satisfies this, I can generate, I can synthesize with some omega later on. Right? The same thing that I said before. So I optimize my problem using this. I optimize the mean square error. I optimize the sigma. As long as this is satisfied, I can later on find an omega such that the diagonal elements are equal to this. By the way, this inverse plays the role of the m. Okay, in case the, this m is the inverse. Huh? So this is the simplification, which is a lot because I can get rid of the omega now. You see. I get rid of the omega, I can deal with the power location first. Once I have the um, uh, power location, I can find the omega very easily with some algorithm. Yes, some question? Uh, there's nothing about the uniqueness of omega, right? No, actually no. In some cases, it's not unique. Yeah, no, it's not. But it's very easy to find this omega, okay? In some cases, you can have a closed form expression. In some others, uh, you, you have an algorithm with finite time. In n loops, you find it. OK, so that's it. Now we have this. Let's look into detail in the, uh, on this uh, equation. Still, we have the inverse of a matrix, right? Which is not nice. But it's nice in this case, because this matrix is diagonal. So it, this is like taking the inverse of the diagonal elements, right? So that's what I'm going to do. The diagonal elements here are going to be 1 over 1 plus sigma square times lambda h, right? I'm going to call sigma square p. It's like power. So at the end, the diagonal elements here are going to be 1 divided by 1 plus p times lambda. Look, this is what I wrote here. So look, I go from here to here. That's it. You see? And now my, op my optimization variable now are the powers. Before it was the sigma and omega. Mm, here is the sigma. Here is the power. Okay. So now that I have this, I can rewrite my problem like this. Much simpler, right? Minimize some function of the mean square errors as long as this function uh, is minorized by this other vector, and as long as this vector is minorized by by this other vector, and that's it. So these are linear constraints. Really easy. This constraint. It's not clear if it's a nice constraint or not from the point of view of optimization, right? Let's take a look. Remember, the majorization, the definition of this majorization relation has some partial summations. So let's write the partial summations. So we write this like this, yeah? some partial summations, right? This is just from the definition. Well, if you take a look at this, you see that so the idea is that instead of writing this, we can write a bunch of these partial summations. So it's the same thing. The problem here is that, well, this is linear. Each of these summations is linear in these mean square errors. That's fine. This is convex in P, right? 
convex in lambda is fixed, okay? Lambda is the, the eigenvalues of the channel. This is convex in P, the sum is convex. So we have a linear term and a convex. But that, that's bad because the convex function is on the wrong side of the inequality. So this does not define a convex set. The convex function should be on this side. So this is bad news. Yes? So you assume the mean square SM decreasing Yeah, okay. Here I'm not just I'm just giving the idea. Yes. Uh, here you need to assume that they are in decreasing order, okay? So in, in detail you can deal properly with all these things, okay? But let me now hand wave a little bit. So you have this non-convex, which is bad from the point of view of optimization because you cannot use KKT conditions or numerical algorithms or anything. However, there is a trick that you can use here to make this convex. It's a very simple trick, okay? I'm not telling you the trick. You can ask me later if you want, but just let you know that there is a way to make this, to make this convex, okay? So at the end, look, this is the final problem formulation. So this is the algorithm for, a ma for designing, to design a, li a linear MIMO transceiver. First, I solve the previous simplified problem, and then I obtain, I obtain the mean squares and the power location, right? Then uh, I, from the power location, I can define the sigma matrix, right? And then now I can find the omega to satisfy that which can be easily done. After that, that's it. I have my precoder. I have my precoder. I have each of these matrices. That's it. And after I have the precoder, I can find the, the, the optimal receiver, the Wiener filter. It's as simple as that. This is really simple. And this works for any function, okay? This works for any function. Any function here. Not decreasing, of course. That's it. This is a final result for the linear. Okay. Let me, now I need to do the decision feedback. Any questions at this point? I'm going to do the same thing now for the decision feedback, okay? Same steps, the same ideas. It's, it's actually very different. It's actually very different. The details are very different, but the ideas are the same. And I'm going to present them to you in a way that they look the same. Let me do it. So this was the decision feedback case. Completely different problem, okay? With the QR decomposition, different. Okay, first step is exactly like in the other one. The same thing. I write the singular value decompositions of the channel and of the precoder. And I can prove, using matrix algebra, that the optimal U is equal to VH. So the same thing. The optimal transmit directions are the directions of the channel. I can do that. Okay? Now, once I have that, I can put all these things, all these singular value decompositions, in this QR decomposition. And then I simplify it. Let me skip all this. And then I get this. So you know, I, I didn't really solve anything here. I still have the QR decomposition, and I have the omega. Yeah. So since you already uh, realized that uh, the precoder will actually, together with this uh, channel, will diagonalize the channel. So essentially, precoder plus channel will give you a set of parallel non-interference channels without any crosstalk. Not really. Just with different not really. SNRs on top of No, not really, not really. Why, you still like have this rotation that may destroy all that. Mm, no, Anim no yes. it is, oh, this rotation yeah. is applied to your apps. Yeah. You can, uh, you can always absorb one of those. But then you are mixing the substreams. So, if no, if so say that you have some symbols, right? If you have a rotation, the first thing the precoder is going to do is rotate the symbols. So mix the different symbols. Well, and then it just means I redefine my code book. So what's wrong with that? Well, what I'm saying is that, yes, you will have parallel channels, but each of them will have a combination of all the symbols. Is the design of your code book? Hmm? It's just, it's a different, you, you, you just, you you just on, on, on fly, you, you, you rotate your installation. Yes. But, but, the, but the advantage of that, you are in the receiver, you're dealing with a stream of parallel channels, you can do what the fell, you don't need to do the uh, demixing. I mean, the receiver becomes much simpler. Well, transmitter becomes more complicated, of course. But the receiver will be just, you know. So you get rid of matrices. Yes, except the rotation. You still don't get. Well, uh, well this, this rotation you can absorb somewhere. Well, but you, you still have to design it. Mm. Yes. Obviously. So th for that, we will use major decision theory to design the rotation. But I agree that if you remove the rotation, then that's it. It's, and that happens in particular with true concave functions, 
when the function is sure concave, it turns out that the optimal rotation is the identity. Uh, this happens in both cases, in the linear and uh, and then yeah, it's that fully comes, comes from common sense that you know. But you know what? The channel does not without crosstalk. You do not need. But for some functions, you don't want that. You want to mix everything and then uh, mix them. Oh. Yeah. I can give you later, later a very simple example that shows that. Anyway, so this is the you know simplified problem after step one, right? But still, I have this QR decomposition and the omega. Okay, I'm gonna go quick because. I should finish soon, right? At what time? Okay, I'll try to finish in five minutes, okay? So this is this is the problem, okay? Now we need major session theory. Let me let me tell you about major session theory in a different way. Look at this. This is the same thing, but it this is something that it's called multiplicative majorization theory. The it's the same idea. But now I'm going to replace the partial summations by products, par partial products. Okay? This is called multiplicative majorization theory. And I'm going to denote that like before, but with a, you know, the multiplication sign here. Okay? <coughs> Same definition, slightly different. By the way, here the product of the elements have to be, has to be equal on both vectors. Okay? By the way, by the way, it's not difficult to see that if I take the log on both sides, I get the additive majorization relationship from the beginning. Right? I take the log here, log of a product is the sum of logs. So if I think now of my variables, the log of x and the log of y, it becomes additive, the, the classical additive majorization. Okay? It's just an observation. Okay, so what can I say using this multiplicative majorization? about matrices it's similar to what I said before you see looks similar so before here I had the eigenvalues of a positive semi-definite matrix and here I had a vector with equal elements right now it's the same thing but now instead now by the way my matrix can be rectangular now so this is a rectangular matrix I'm not doing any eigenvalue decomposition here so here I'm taking the singular values instead of the eigenvalues this extreme contains the singular values, okay? Uh, the other extreme is a vector with equal elements, but just because I'm using the multiplicative majorization relationship, I need the product of the elements to be equal, right? So I'm going to define these elements as the geometric mean of, this, of the singular values. So it makes sense, right? And now, what do I put in the middle? Before in the middle, I had the diagonal elements of a matrix, right? Now it's different, it's a bit more complicated. Now what I do is the following. This is a new operator, if you want. I define this operator, R of a matrix, as the following. I take the matrix, I find the QR decomposition, I take the diagonal elements of the R. That's what this denotes, R. Okay? So the diagonal elements of the R matrix in the QR decomposition. So what majorization theory says here is, is this. It's the same as before. For any omega, the r vector is going to be in between the two extremes. And the opposite is also true, the, the, the achievability. A, if you give me a vector that is in between these two extremes, I can always find an omega such that the diagonal elements of the r in the QR decomposition are equal to the vector that you gave me. Okay? The same idea. It looks more complicated, the details are more complicated, but it's the same idea. So, so singular is just how singular values? Yeah, this is the singular values of M. Like yeah. Left, Sorry? Uh, so, yeah. So M doesn't have to be square. No, no, it's a, any, any meter, it's rectangular, whatever, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing I did before, the same thing. This is a nasty thing that I have in my problem. This QR decomposition where I have the Q, the R, and the omega, right? many things. So what I'm going to do is, instead of writing this, I'm going to write this. <coughs> Why? Look at this. <coughs> forget the, the two, the exponent. This is just, forget the two for the moment. If I can find a vector R such that it is multiplicatively majorized by these uh, singular values, 
it means from what I said before that you can always find an omega such that when you multiply this matrix by the omega the QL decomposition has an R with diagonal elements given by this vector that you gave me okay? same thing a bit more complicated so the idea is that now instead of writing this I can write this I get rid of omega I get rid of Q I get rid of R everything and then this becomes really easy becomes like this so eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix everything becomes like I get rid of the matrices at the end I get something like this okay and this is the idea now uh, now I can write my simplified problem like this right like I did before it's function of the mean squares the mean squares are given by the r to the power of minus 2 and this r has to satisfy this now this multiplicatively majorization relationship is not nice because we have the, these products that's not nice so we can take the log and make it an additive one like I mentioned before okay so you can take the log on this side you, you get logs get the log here you define a new variable blah, 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 and you can it's a makeup this is really makeup and you get something like that which is now convex everything is con all these constraints are convex these are linear and convex everything is very nice so that's that's it this is um, Yeah, well, the cost function is here. So, if it, well, if you really want this problem to be convex, then this composition of f with exponential has to be convex. Yeah, yeah. But even if it's not convex, this is much simpler now than a matrix valued optimization. But yeah, typically it's convex with most common f uh, functions. So this is the algorithm at the end. The same idea as before. You solve the simplified problem. Okay, that gives you the power location, and then that gives you sigma. After you have sigma, you can find the rotation omega, and then that's it. You have the recorder, and once you have the recorder, you have the receiver. So it's it's really easy. So so in this step, right, this algorithm you described. Suppose you went and sort of what Leo was sort of raising, what x and x had. Yeah. Decisions. I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't know. I don't know this what form, this form basically comes directly from zooming. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what that. Well, there would be, There should be some uh, errors. You, of course, when it comes to errors, since we don't know the errors, but we know the statistics, so we can have a kind of. You can find the matrix in a statistical sense. That it's the best B, which on average or after averaging over all the errors gives us the uh, smallest uh, mean square error for each stream. Then the results will be probably slightly different and will reflect this error statistics. Yeah, yeah. But it has to be. The performance of the decoder should depend on us enough, for example. And he, since his first cut, like he, he is strictly diagonal, so he, he does kind of a uh, iterative, iterative uh, interference cancellation. So whatever his first estimate is determines actually how well his latest steps will I should mention that the same thing that I did for the decision feedback case can be done using this duality between uh, decision feedback and um, DT paper coding you can move this decision feedback part to the transmitter using DT paper coding yeah that's actually and then you get rid of the of the error propagation well actually you can I just it, it's, it's very easy takes half a page. You can actually really completely eliminate the uh, interference between the streams. It's very easy. I and mean, on the receiver it will just cost you one extra multiplication by a matrix on the front end. Mm -hmm. You just take, you even don't need to rotate the constellation. With existing constellation, just receiver multiplies by omega cross in the beginning and then the thing becomes completely decoupled. And since your omega already determined, so it should be constant matrix. Mm -hmm. Depending on for every age, you always have. Okay, mm -hmm. okay so um, I'm going to skip many slides. Actually, the thing is that this is a simplified problem, right? But if you now choose some particular types of functions, true concave, true convex, it simplifies even more. 
the structure simplifies in many in many cases the structure becomes fully diagonal with rotation without rotation in other cases you actually need a rotation and it simplifies so much that in in most cases you can actually you don't even need to solve any any problem to find the power location in most cases the power location you can write it down in closed form in most cases it has a kind of water filling flavor different variations of water filling but anyway so i'm going to skip all that you know so if i have the sum of the squared errors what is that is that does it have any yeah 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 this is like the base oh by the way the, this is an example you know for sure concave everything is diagonal <laughs> for sure convex everything diagonal but the rotation so yeah you can think you can think of the rotation as part of the constellation so for example what you were saying um for example, this is the list of functions that are sure convex or sure concave. Most most of the ones you can think of are, for example, the, the sum of the mean square that you're asking is a sure concave function. Even the weight the weighted sum of the mean square is also sure con sure concave. Okay. Anyway, ma many functions are either sure concave or concave. Anyway, some simulations, but anyway, simulations are just. So uh, let me summarize. Let me summarize by saying that this was, these were our two initial problems, linear case, decision fit by case, okay? Some function of the mean square error, where the mean square error are these two crazy expressions. So the first thing we did was, we optimized the receiver fixing the transmitter, and then this is what we got, two, you know, kind of simplified versions, but still very nasty. So the next, for the next step, we used major session theory, and we obtain these two very simple uh, formulations that you can readily, readily solve either numerically or typically in, in closed form. Okay. And yeah, as I mentioned, for sure concave, sure convex functions, they simplify even further. Um, that's it. So if you want more information, uh, you can find this, this is some publicity, you can find this monograph where we talk about these two designs, linear decision feedback using major recession theory. Okay. There, is a, there is a chapter on major recession theory, a very short chapter, in case you wanna, you have curiosity about that, because if you take a look at the book, the book is a really long, long book. Th I mean, the original book in on my organization. Um, and you know, this is a topic on which I have worked with many people, really. Like going back to my PhD thesis with my advisor, you know, many people on the linear stuff, and more recently on the decision feedback part. Okay, this is very recent. And that's it. Thank you. And I would love to discuss things with people uh, now or, you know, later. <laughs>